to be talking about the marriage at Cana, uh, which I, there's a lot in this, and I want to just share a few thoughts about the marriage at Cana. Uh, there's so many levels that are in it that it can be a blessing. And I'd like to just read from the Living Bible. It uh, says there, two days later, Jesus' mother was a guest at a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus and his disciples were invited too. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, and Jesus' mother came to him with the problem. I can't help you now, he said. It isn't yet my time for miracles. So just underlining that, it isn't yet my time for miracles. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you to. So there must have been a bit of dialogue here. She went to him and he said, listen, it's not my time yet. But then after a discussion, mother and son, uh, she goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Six stone water pots were standing there that were used for Jewish, Jewish ceremonial purposes and held perhaps 20 to 30 gallons each. You know, that's, that's a lot of water that they would hold. You know that a small car can hold 12 gallons and a bigger car can hold about 15 gallons. But here we have each one of them could hold between 20 and 30 gallons. And there were six of them. I, I can't imagine them picking them up and carrying them around. These were huge. It's a lot of, of uh, water that was held in them. Then Jesus told the servants to fill them to the brim. So not halfway up. Fill these water jars to the brim. When this was done, he said, dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. So that was quite a step of faith that those servants had to do to take that water that was in there to the master of ceremonies. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants did, he called the bridegroom over. And he said, this is wonderful stuff, he said. You're different from most. Usually a host uses the best wine first, and then afterwards, when everyone is full and doesn't care anymore, in other words, they're all a bit tipsy, I think, then he brings out the least expensive brands. But you have kept the best for last. I want to end up with that portion there. But you have kept the best for last. I love that. God has kept the best for last. For you as an individual and for the church as a whole, I believe that God has kept the best for last. He's got something for us that I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. And I've, I'm trusting today that as I speak, that your hearts are going to catch on fire, that your hearts are going to spark and think, you know, my God can do far above what I can dare to ask or think. That it's not over till that big angel up there sings. You know, it does say <laughs> in the operas, it's not over till the fat lady sings. But it's not over till the angels sing. Amen? Amen. God has kept the best wine till last. You know, this was the beginning of Jesus' miracle ministry. It was like the initiation, turning water into wine. It was the initiation. Jesus did this. And it's an amazing miracle on so many levels. It's always intrigued me because Jesus, in the beginning of his miracle ministry, turned water into wine. But when we look at the beginning of Moses' ministry, he, his first miracle, the initiation, you could say, was turning water into blood. And that's always intrigued me. What, what does this mean? There must be some significance so after deep prayer, I looked on Dr. Google, and uh, I found out a bit of information there on Dr. Google, and what I see was that when Moses, who symbolizes the law, when, when he turned water into blood, 
millions of fish died. But when Jesus turned water into wine, which speaks of the new covenant, which speaks of the forgiveness of sin, we see that millions of people are able to come alive because of that miracle of turning water into, into wine. So we see that this was the initiation for Jesus, just as that was the initiation for Moses. It says in 1 John, uh, John 1 17, it says that the law was given by Moses, but we see that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, turning this water into wine. The water into blood caused death, as the law brings death, but the water into wine brings life, as grace brings life, praise God. And you know, Jesus said to the disciples, you know, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And we see that many, many people became alive because of what Jesus did. It says in, uh, the, uh, in uh, Ezekiel, it says that there was the river of God and there were, there were people fishing on the banks of the river, catching those fish that were there, and those fish were people. So Jesus' ministry caused fish to come alive, praise God, caused people to come alive. I have come, he said, to give you life and life abundant. Just remind yourself of that today. I, I think I shared last time, I remind myself with my digital watch, is whenever I see 1010, I'm reminded of John 10.10. 10. It says, the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life abundant. So if you feel today that you have been robbed, I can tell you now that that's not the Lord who's doing that. He's not robbing or stealing or killing. He has come to give you life, and not just any old life. He's come to give you an abundant life. Praise God. He's come to give you an abundant life. And one of the first things I want to bring out today is the power of prayer. You know, Mary came to Jesus and asked him to do something. Isn't that prayer? Really, when we go and ask Jesus to do something, we are praying. And his reply was, as I said there before, he said, it's not my time yet to do miracles. It isn't yet my time for miracles. But when she came and asked him, and I don't know all the dialogue that took place, that when she came and asked him to, to do this, he brought his miracle ministry forward. He brought it forward. I don't know when he was planning to do miracles, but because of her coming and asking, she put pressure on him, and he brought into the now what was meant to be in the future. You see the power of prayer. You can bring into the now what is reserved for a later date because of prayer, praise God. He said, it's not my time yet, but he brought into the now. You know, if she uh, hadn't have gone and asked him to do that, guess what? They would have all been sipping water for the rest of the evening. They wouldn't have had any wine. But because she put pressure on him and asked him to do it, that wine was produced. That's, that's, that is quite a, an eye-opener, really, because you can, if you don't ask, you don't receive, and you can end up having quite a watery life, quite a bland life, if you don't go to the Lord believing. She believed in his miracle ministry. She knew what he could do. He'd never done one before, but she remembered what the angel of the Lord said. She remembered what had been told her and so she went and said, well, listen, they've got a problem. Can't you help? And at first he says, no, it's not my time. But I don't know what she did, but she put pressure on him, as mothers can do. And she brought the future of miracle ministry into the present. And you know, Jesus can enrich your life. You might think that you've got a pretty watery, bland life. But you know, Jesus can enrich your life. He can, he can cause your life, as it were, to become rich and, and like wine. You know, just because there's a need doesn't mean to say that God's going to do anything. You know, if that were the case, then all the sick people around would be healed, just like that today. Or all the people who've got money problems would have money because there's a need. 
But we see from Scripture that you've got to exercise faith. You've got to come and pray. You've got to seek God's face. It just doesn't happen because you've got a need. You've got to bring your need to God. And things can change. God can change the future for you. He didn't respond, as it were, until Mary came and spoke to him and put the pressure on, and then he caused this miracle to take place. You know, it's God's responsibility to get you to heaven, but it's your responsibility to bring heaven here to earth. I say that again. It's your responsibility to bring heaven here to earth because he tells you in the Lord's Prayer, you are to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are to pray that. And that which is in heaven is amazing. And we can bring those things from heaven to earth because of our prayers. Praise God. We can bring miracles into our life because of our prayers. We can bring supernatural things into the now through our prayers. We can bring heaven to earth. It also shows us there that a mother's prayers are powerful, so don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your loved ones, because mother's prayers are very powerful. We see another time when that which was in the future was brought into the present. The Canaanites were Gentiles. They weren't the blessed ones like the Jews were, and Jesus was sent to the Jews. And she came to Jesus. He had heard about what he could do. And she says there, a woman from Canaan who was living there came to him, pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, King David's son, for my daughter has a demon within her and it torments her constantly. But Jesus gave her no reply. You know, wouldn't that be a bit of a slap on the face? Come to Jesus and he just ignores you. You might think at times he's doing that to you. But uh, he's not. He's listening to you. But he ignored her at first, and he said he didn't say a word. Then the disciples urged him to send her away, and they start chipping in and saying, well, send this woman away. Tell her to go away, they said, for she is bothering us with all her begging. Then he said to the woman, I was sent to help the Jews, the lost sheep of Israel, not to the Gentiles. But she came and worshipped him and pled again, sir, help me. It doesn't seem right to take bread from the children and throw it to the dogs, he said. So he's calling her a dog because she's a Gentile. That was a term that uh, the Jewish people used to use for the, for the Gentiles. And then she doesn't give up again. She says, yes, it is, she replied, for even the puppies beneath the table are permitted to eat the crumbs that fall. And Jesus just said, wow, you know, woman. Jesus told her, your faith is large and your request is granted, and her daughter was healed right then. So there we see faith. There we see a woman coming to Jesus, not being put off because she knew what he was really like. And what happened there was that that which was reserved for the future was brought into the now. It wasn't the Gentiles' time until three and a half years after Jesus' death upon the cross when the church went out and uh, Peter had that vision of the blanket coming down from heaven and all the animals in it and Cornelius coming. And so that's when the gospel went out to the Gentiles. But she tapped in to the future in a sense and Jesus brought that which was in the future by about four years or five years, I don't know how much it was before then, brought that into the now because she came in faith and cried out to him. Be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged and believe what God can do. God can do it. He responded to her faith. He responded to her prayers, praise God. God wants to. He wants to bring life. He wants to heal. Since the cross, it's open for all of us now, praise God. I love this scripture. It says there in Hebrews 6, 5, those who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. I want to encourage you that you can taste the powers of the coming age even today because you're encouraged to pray that prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
That which one day is reserved for heaven can be brought into the now, praise God. You can be healed now. You can be blessed now, praise the Lord. Taste the powers of the age that is to come. We have Abraham. Romans 4.17, God speaks of Abraham who had that amazing miracle of having a child in his old age. It says, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things that are not as though they were. He calls those things out there that we can't see. He calls them into the now. He calls them in. Our God can do that. And he encourages us to do the same. We are the children of Abraham. We are the children of faith. We can call in those things that are in the unseen. We can bring them into the now. And I'm encouraging you today, especially when you're having that time of prayer later, to call in these blessings. Call in the will of God. Call in heaven. Heaven to earth. Now, one of the amazing things about turning water into wine is the fact that DNA was changed. The DNA of the waters changed. We're dealing with an amazing God here, and we need to be thinking about this more, that God can change your DNA. Amen? You know, we speak of regeneration. We can be regenerated. Amen? We're going to have our genes changed. You know, from Levi's to some other brand. <laughs> we can be regenerated, praise God. Water to wine. That's a miracle, changing the DNA. Do you know that uh, out of all of God's creation, he's made lots of different animals and they get sick, but I read the other day that sharks can't get sick. That a shark can't get sick. It's in their DNA. They don't get sick. And uh, we have a God who created us and he can change us. He can change us on the inside. And we need to be reminding ourselves often that Jesus is in us. Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. I love the Passion Translation of that. It says, living in you is the Christ who fills you with an expectation of glory. Living in you is the Christ who fills you with an expectation of glory. With Jesus in you, with you meditating on Jesus day and night, you start to develop an expectation for glory. When Lazarus died, and he got so bad that he stinketh, as, uh, as uh, Mary said, he stinketh, Lord. <laughs> uh, when he died, uh, he said to Mary, if you believe, today you will see the glory of God. The glory of God on that particular day was the raising of Lazarus from the dead after four days. And when you have Christ in you and you're realizing that and, and thinking about it and meditating on it, you can't help but expect miracles. You can't help but expect healing. You can't help but expect to be revitalized by the Lord. It's, it becomes part of you. The Word becomes flesh and dwells in you. It says in 2 uh, Colossians 9 that you have everything when you have Christ and you're filled with God and your union with Christ. Do you realize that, that you have everything when you have Christ? Trouble is, we're not thinking about these things enough. We'll spend hours and hours and hours thinking about all sorts of other stuff when if we could only meditate on the Word of God and think about wonderful truths that Christ is in us. Jesus is in us. He wants to live through you. He wants to think through you. He wants to revitalize you. Praise God. I see this uh, scripture here. It says in John 14, 27, Jesus said... Before he left, he said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. You know, when you look at that word peace, it means more than just an absence of war. In, in, uh, in Hebrew, peace is shalom. And it always seems to be used twice. Shalom, shalom. Am I right? Shalom, shalom. That is not just an absence of war. That is health. That is well-being. He says, my peace I give to you. When you've got Jesus inside of you, he has given you his peace. He's given you his shalom. He's given you his well-being. He's given you his health. 
He's given you vitality. He's given you energy. I claim that all the time. And I, I know it's true that he can do this. Praise God. He can revitalize you, regenerate you, change your DNA. He can do all sorts of things inside you. He's given you his peace. I have no record in Scripture that Jesus was ever sick. He's alive in you. Amen. He wants to live through you. Shalom, shalom, well-being, health, energy, stamina, youth. And, you know, do you realize that you can, you can think your way to success? You can think your way to success. You know why I say that? Because it says meditate on the word day and night and you'll prosper and have good success. Meditating is thinking, isn't it? And so by changing your thinking from stinking thinking into meditating on the word of God day and night... You'll prosper and have good success. He can change your DNA. You might have had your father die of this disease and your grandmother die of that disease and you keep saying, well, it's in my genes, it's in my DNA, I can't escape it. That's not true. My father died at, what was it, he was, I don't think he even reached 60. And the doctor said to me way back then, so many Decades ago, <laughs> he said to me, many years ago, he said, you know, you've got the same problem here. But I've rejected that. I said, I'm not going to have that, amen? I, I've, I'm a new creation in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am a son of God, heavily disguised as an old man. <laughs> but I have Christ in me, amen? That's what I want to confess. And that's what he can do for you. The other thing is that he sped things up. You know, to turn water into wine, uh, when you are preparing wine, it's six months to six years to make a good wine. Jesus did that in like six seconds. Six big water pots, he changed. And I can see in scripture where the Lord said, I'm going to speed things up. For some of you older people here today, things seem to be speeding up fast. But there are scriptures that tell us that he's going to do a quick work in the earth. And things are speeding up. We see it in Israel. We see all sorts of things happening. That things are speeding up. And he says there in Romans 9.28, For he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. I believe God can cause a fast work to happen. In your life and in the church, we may think that all is lost, but I'm going to try and convince you today that that's not true. In Amos 9.13, there's a quite a hard scripture to understand, which says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, the, re the treader of grapes who sows seed, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. You think, what on earth does that mean? You're trying to work out about a plowman overtaking the reaper. But in the message translation, it says, yes, indeed, it won't be long now, God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast, your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of another. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening all at once. Everywhere you look, blessings. Amen? Well, that's what I'm believing for. Everywhere you look, blessings. Things are going to start speeding up, praise God. You know, we haven't arrived yet. We haven't arrived yet because your sh shadow isn't healing the sick yet. Because that's what Peter did. And it says, the works that Jesus did shall we do also. And greater works than these shall we do because he's gone to the Father. And so Peter did a greater work by his shadow healing the sick. And then it goes on to say that Everyone was healed in the New Testament church. We think only Jesus, everyone was healed. But we see the early church, everyone was healed. Look, you look at the Acts chapter 5, I think it's around about 15. It says that everyone was healed. That's not happening yet, so we haven't arrived yet. God is wanting to do it. He wants us to change our thinking to believe for such a thing as this. You might say, well, nothing seems to be happening for me. I'm sort of in a, I feel like I'm just watery. I'm in a place now where nothing much is happening. But when you look, before John the Baptist, there were 300 years when nothing much happened. There was no prophetic word, no prophets, nothing happened for 300 years. And then suddenly, immediately, 
Suddenly, John the Baptist turned up on the scene, and he started preaching, and people listened to him and said, that's the word of God. I know that really is God speaking. That's words with authority. This man is a prophet. And so it said all of Judea came out to listen to him. That was quite a revival going on there. And John the Baptist came onto the scene. Suddenly, after all of this drought of nothingness, suddenly he came onto the scene. Next minute, or as they say in New Zealand, next minute, next minute we see Jesus turned up. And he started doing all that John the Baptist was talking about. Miracles were taking place. And then he died, but that wasn't the end of it. Suddenly the church was birthed. And then we see that the works that Jesus did, they started doing also, and greater works than these. So it seemed like all was lost, that everything had gone, but suddenly this happened, came onto the scene. And I'm just, I just know, when you look at the life of Jesus, whenever he ministered, it said immediately this happened. I, I'm looking for the day that when we pray for people, that immediately the person's going to be healed. Immediately, not... See you next week. Be encouraged, brother. You know, it's all going to happen. But that's what I believe the Lord's wanting us to come to, to do the works that he did, and greater works than these shall we do. If you believe. It says that he saved the best to last. You know, when you look at um, the monic butterfly, we often think of that as like being born again, that you were a caterpillar, and then you became born again and turned into a butterfly. And I like that analogy. A monic butterfly speaks of royalty, monic royalty. And what we see there is that I, I think many of us as Christians have uh, turned into butterflies, but we're still eating the same food that the caterpillars ate. I've used that illustration before. We're still on the same diet. But you'll notice that butterflies don't eat caterpillar food. They have honey now. They have nectar out of flowers. And that's what we should be into. The word of God is like a honey, like a nectar. We should be eating, drinking, and sleeping, as it were, the word of God. It's our honey, praise God. And I believe that this word, saving the best to last, saving the best to last, I've got that there. But you have kept the best to last. That that uh, master of ceremonies was amazed. He said, you know, you have saved the best till last. And as an individual, don't think that because you, you've got grey hair that you've gone past your use-by date. I know some of you, when you go to the supermarket, you check it, oh mm, dear, you know, gone past the use-by date. Uh, you, you can't go past your use-by date. If you're alive as a Christian and breathing, and even if... Look at Lazarus. He was stinking, yet he still got raised from the dead. God, it's, you never go past your use-by date as a Christian. You can't go past your use-by date as an individual. It says there, I've got this scripture I want to show you. It says there, The path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto that perfect day. I've shared this with you before, but this is a scripture I quote often. I'm not believing for my path to get darker and darker. I'm believing for my path to get brighter and brighter. I especially quote it as the first scripture that I use on a New Year's Eve day, the first at midnight. My path this year, I prophesy over my year, is going to get brighter and brighter, and it's going to shine more and more to the perfect day, the perfect day will be when it's all over, praise God, and we are with Jesus forever. Amen? Amen? Our path is to get brighter and brighter. I confess that over myself, and I pray you will too. It says in Psalm 92, But the godly shall flourish like palm trees and grow tall as the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted into the Lord's own garden, and are under his personal care. For even in old age, they will still produce fruit and be vital and green. This honors the Lord and exhibits his faithful care. He is my shelter. There is nothing but goodness in him. You know, palm trees bring forth their best harvest at the end of their life. So if you feel you're getting on there, 
Start claiming that you're going to bring forth your best harvest at the end of your life. Believe for better things in the days that lie ahead. Praise God. But this is for the church as well, not just for us as individuals. I believe God has a great plan for the church. John the Baptist was the forerunner, the Elijah that came before Jesus' first coming. And he was like a picture of what Jesus was going to be like. He had to die at the hands of men because that's what was going to happen to Jesus. He died at the hands of men. But the Elijah, the John the Baptist that is coming before the second coming, the Elijah which is to come, is going to be like the coming king. Amen? We are going to be a victorious people. I say we because, who knows, I could be still around when Jesus comes. I don't know when he's coming exactly. But I believe that that church is going to be a church that is going to be like the coming king. A victorious church. Because they're going to be a church that knows that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. They're going to be that people that know that they are the righteousness of God in Christ. There is no condemnation towards them. They know that they are sons and daughters of God. They know it. Their minds are renewed, praise God. And they are believing God to do the works that Jesus did, and greater works than these shall they do. I don't believe the church is going to get weaker and weaker. Those ones who are keeping their eyes on the Lord will get stronger and stronger, praise God. Jesus spoke of the tares and the wheat, and it said there was a field. And there, were, there was wheat planted in the field, which is like the church. But the enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat. And they said, the, they came to the master who'd planted this field and said, should we rip all the tares out? And he says, you better not do that because you might rip out the wheat as well. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And you look around you today and you think, my goodness, look at those tares. They're getting worse. As I've said before, worser and worser. They're getting worse. These tears, evil's getting worse. But don't forget that the wheat is also growing. Amen? The wheat is also growing. We are coming to a harvest. Well, the ones who want to, the ones who believe, the ones who pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it shall be greater for them. I believe God is wanting to bring about, and I'm bringing this to a close, a greater works generation. A generation who understands John 14, 12, where Jesus said, If you believe the works that I do, you shall do also, and even greater works than these. Shall you do? Because I've gone to the Father. And you know, when you understand that Christ is in you, and you're in Christ, you're also there, seated in heavenly places with him. That's why you're able to do these things that the Lord speaks about. It's a church that finally gets it. A church that understands what Jesus was talking about. They know their God and do, their, do exploits. I believe that super generation there is going to be on the earth is going to be a people who know their God and do exploits. Amen? Amen. I'm going to end now with a, an illustration. In, in creation, we have the monarch butterfly. And it, we get them in New Zealand. I presume you still get them here in England, do you? <laughs> we get them in New Zealand, the monarch butterfly. It always reminds me, monarch speaks of royalty. And the monarch butterfly, there, there is a, an, an amazing event that takes place in America each year. And it's worth noting, because I, I can see it's a sign it's a sign to me anyway. And that is this, that each year in the north of America, monarch butterflies fly all the way down, all the way down to uh, 4,500 Ks. They fly all the way down to the mountains of Mexico to a place that is 10,000 feet above sea level into this remote forest. They come there in their millions upon millions and they hibernate in that forest there for four months. And then that generation wakes up, they lay eggs, those little eggs become caterpillars, 
Those caterpillars become butterflies. They last for six to eight weeks. They start moving back up north again within the year cycle. So you've got about four or five generations of butterfly that lay eggs, butterflies come, and they move all the way back up north in that cycle of a year. So none of those butterflies that get up there were, were like they can't remember how they got to Mexico in the first place because they've all died out. But you know, the last generation in their DNA, there's something kicks in and the eggs that they lay in that last generation produce a butterfly that lives eight times longer than its previous generation. And they fly all the way from North America. They, well, there's the cycle there. Six to eight weeks for all of that to happen. Then they fly. They go all the way up to North America. Then they fly all the way back. In four months, they fly back. They hibernate for four months. So they live for eight months. All these other butterflies only live for six to eight weeks. But there's that super generation, the last one, that completes the cycle. And I believe there was some, what, what made them suddenly decide to lay these eggs of a super generation? It was in their DNA. It was all in there to create this butterfly that lasts longer. It looks bigger. It flies for four months and it hibernates for four months and then ordinary butterflies come until the last one and in the last one we have this super generation. I find that fascinating that my God can do such a thing. And I believe that he's got a plan for the best wine last. He's got a plan for the end time generation, for the end time church that he wants to show the greater works that he did, shall we do also, and greater works than these shall we do. That I, I don't believe we have arrived until our shadows heal the sick. I don't believe we've arrived until everyone is healed. I don't see it yet, but it's, I'm not giving up on it. <laughs> I'm believing for it, amen. I see things in my own life, but I believe God has got a great plan for the end time church, and he's saving the best to last. I want you to turn to someone and just say to them this morning, God is saving the best to last for you. Amen? Amen.